Okay, so I'm Marga Johnson from Johns Hopkins and I'll chair session two on DNA and chromatin and hopefully we won't get cut off, but if we do, please just rejoin through the same link and we'll um, carry on. And at the end when you have questions, I think it worked really well when the, if you click the raise hand under the participants, otherwise you can write your question in the chat. So our first speaker is uh, Professor TJ Ha from Johns Hopkins talking about CRISPR and DNA repair. Uh, I'm Dr. Jipa, a TJ at Johns Hopkins. Let me first thank the organizers for this opportunity and we're organizing this uh, meeting that appears to be uh, uh, amazing based on the program. Today I'll tell you a little bit about our recent efforts to create new technologies based on CRISPR uh, to control the activity uh, using light and also their applica applications to DNA repair. CRISPR-Cas9 uh, is a powerful and popular technology for genome editing. It's essentially a pair of uh, molecular scissors for DNA that can cut uh, two strands of DNA at a location of your choice. And this can be programmed using the guide RNA that base pairs with the target strand of the DNA. Once you make the break or DSB for double strand a break, cells can repair this using uh, NHEJ for non-homologous end joining, which can be error prone, creating insertions and deletions or indels for gene disruption. Or you can use a homology directed repair and where you use a template DNA for precise DNA editing or inserting uh, elements uh, of your choice into the genome. However, uh, there are some limitations of CRISPR-Cas9 system in terms of timing. So the technology is asynchronous. You express Cas9 or deliver Cas9 into a cell. They take their time to bind the DNA and cut. So although you do generate uh, breaks, you don't know exactly when the cuts are made. And this is uh, an issue if you want to study processes that are faster than the time it takes for the cleavage to occur on average and which uh, can be uh, as long as an hour or longer. So our goal is to control CRISP activity uh, in space and in time in, in addition to achieving high precision along the genomic coordinate. Our goal is to achieve a microseconds, sorry, micrometer resolution in space and seconds resolution in time. And this work uh, was done by a two incredible young scientists, Yang Liu and Raja Zhou, uh, in a really amazing collaboration with my colleague, Professor Bin Wu's lab at Johns Hopkins University. We call this technology very fast CRISPR on demand. We allow Cas9 to bind the target DNA, but not cut by having a photoclippable blockade on, uh, on the system. Then we deliver light to eliminate the blockade. Then the pair of scissors can close and cut the DNA, only then. And because Cas9 is pre-bound, uh, it doesn't have to search for the target sequence after activation, and it can cut the DNA very rapidly. Therefore, we call it very fast. How does it work? Uh, in more detail shown here. So we have Cas9 bound to the guide RNA and red uh, shows the sequence that is complementary to the target DNA strand. It binds the DNA. Uh, it matched initially a seed region of the duplex DNA and base pair this with the guide RNA. If the base pair is good enough, it can continue to match the DNA and base pair uh, the melted strand with the guide RNA until uh, you have a uh, 17 base pair of more match that triggers uh, cleavage of the two strands of the DNA, which then uh, gets repaired by uh, cellular pathways. But we also know that stable binding uh, actually uh, doesn't need uh, 17 base pairs. You only need about 10 base pairs matched between the guide RNA and the target strand for uh, ultra stable binding. 
So there is actually a gap, uh, a window of opportunity uh, to uh, tweak here uh, between the two activities. So we chose to put photo clippable Cajun groups onto the distal side of the guide RNA so that it can still allow uh, base pairing uh, and uh, stable binding of Cas9 to the DNA, but not a complete annealing between the guide and the DNA strand and no uh, cleavage. Then uh, we shine light to eliminate the Cajun groups, allowing the RNA to uh, base pair with the target strand to complete the process and cutting the DNA. Because the Cas9 is pre-bound, it can be very fast. So if you want, uh, here we have uh, a number of uh, cells um, uh, lining up uh, pre-bound the DNA, waiting for your signal that you deliver using light. And then, only then, they cut the DNA rapidly starting the process. Using this asynchronous DNA cleavage, we can study now uh, uh, DNA repair processes that could not be studied before because of the lack of synchronization. It works really well. Uh, in human cells, uh, we can actually uh, show this uh, DNA break generation efficiency of 50% or higher, even at the earliest time point of 30 seconds. And this is uh, much faster than the previous record of chemically induced Cas9 reported uh, in this paper. So this shows that uh, our very fast CRISPR system cuts the DNA in seconds after light, and it has a high efficiency. Once you make the cut, uh, there are several different DNA uh, break sensor proteins that can arrive. And they also recruit uh, several important kinases. One of, the, one of the most important one is called ATM kinase. ATM kinase gets recruited by uh, early uh, responder uh, to the break. It phosphorylates, among many other proteins, a uh, histone uh, variant called H2AX. And that uh, phosphorylated uh, H2AX histone uh, is called gamma H2AX. And um, uh, amazingly, uh, this uh, phosphorylation actually can uh, reach beyond a uh, megabase pair surrounding the cut site. And uh, it's now believed that uh, this modification uh, changes the physical properties of the chromatin uh, surrounding the cut site, preparing the uh, region for uh, efficient DNA repair, forming this DNA repair foci. This phosphorylation can also recruit ad additional proteins, including ATM, uh, that is uh, thought to be a mechanism to propagate uh, phosphorylation to the surrounding chromatin gradually. However, uh, a few months ago, there was a preprint uh, proposing that loop extrusion by coisin uh, uh, is responsible for uh, DNA damage foci formation when you cause uh, a break to occur. And uh, this is uh, based on the data of ChIP-seq showing that, that uh, gamma H2AX um, uh, signal uh, boundaries uh, coincide with uh, boundaries of TADs or topologically associated domains uh, limited by CTCFs. So we think that we can use a kinetic tool, uh, very fast CRISPR, to chat test whether this mechanism uh, is uh, uh, viable. And here's uh, an example. So we developed a time-resolved uh, uh, chip-seq method where we uh, create a break using light, and then we harvest the cells at different time points. And then we use antibodies against a protein of interest, or in this case, uh, phosphorylated H2, gamma H, um, H2AX, uh, to collect the chromatin fragments. That's chromatin immunoprecipitation chip. Then uh, we sequence the fragments and align to the genome to build a chip seq map along uh, the genomic coordinates. And uh, the question is, can you use this time-resolved chip seq to determine the spreading kinetics of gamma H2AX? This is an uh, example data set. Uh, so you make a cut here. This is 11 megabase pair region uh, around the cut site. No light, just background. 
two minutes after light, we see a small tiny bump here above the background. Then this becomes taller and wider at five minutes, even wider at 15 minutes, wider yet at 30 minutes and one hour. So you can actually measure uh, the width uh, as a function of time and show that the width increases linearly in time uh, with a speed of approximately 150 kilobase pairs per minute. To me, which was amazingly uh, fast. So now that uh, we have the kinetic data, uh, we can see whether the loop extrusion model uh, can be supported by the data. So what is that model actually tell us, telling us? Well, uh, you know, we uh, create a break at a defined moment, then uh, ATM kinase will be recruited. Then uh, if cuisin uh, uh, causes a loop extrusion to occur, uh, the chromatin will be uh, revealed in uh, gradually through the ATM uh, sitting here. Uh, causing gamma H2AX uh, formation. And this can continue to form a larger and larger domains of histone phosphorylation and until it uh, stops uh, upon reaching, let's say, CTCF or TED boundaries. This model have, uh, has two predictions, uh, propagation of uh, H2AX uh, phosphorylation then should actually uh, be linear uh, in time because it's one dimensional movement, uh, directional uh, motor function. Second, uh, uh, this press speed has to match the cohesion loop extrusion speed. So we can actually uh, convert that uh, bidirectional uh, propagation per minute into a unidirectional propagation per uh, uh, movement speed per second. And we found that based on our data, we can predict that cohesion speed of loop extrusion is about uh, 1,200 base pairs per second. This matches very nicely with um, 900 base pairs per second from hu human cuisine loop extrusion and 1,500 base pairs per second for ease condensing loop extrusion. So I'm going to actually stop uh, this uh, part uh, uh, about a paper that we published last week. Uh, because uh, Yang Lu, uh, a talented postdoc, is going to present uh, the rest of the paper uh, next week, uh, so on Thursday, uh, where he uses a single cell uh, live imaging method uh, to uh, study gene editing and DNA repair dynamics at the single cell level and even at the level of single alleles. So far, we have talked about uh, turning on the CRISPR activity using light. What about turning it off? This could be very useful uh, because uh, people believe that residual uh, Cas9 activities, even after gene editing has been achieved, could be responsible for uh, many of the negative effects, such as off-target effects and uh, large uh, genomic alterations uh, that uh, you didn't actually uh, want to have. So there are several different approaches to uh, turn things off uh, using chemical inhibitors or anti-CRISPR proteins and so on, but they usually suffer from uh, slow kinetics and high residual, residual activity. And they often have multi-component systems making it impractical to use uh, them for a wide uh, variety of systems. So now Roger is now taking the lead uh, uh, to uh, create a very fast Cas9 deactivation. So in this uh, technology, uh, he puts a photoclippable group on in the middle of the guide RNA. And uh, this actually still functions. It can still bind the DNA and cut the DNA uh, without any uh, negative effect. But once you shine light to cleave up that piece of the RNA, then uh, RNA have the truncation is too short uh, for Cas9 activity, and you don't get uh, any additional uh, cleavage. So we have a single component system, uh, very flexible, a light-controlled kill switch or off switch. So to test uh, this uh, method, uh, we uh, use electroporation to deliver Cas9 uh, plus photoclippable RNA into the cells, and then we harvest the cells uh, three days later for sequencing to score DNA editing efficiencies. We can inactivate uh, the system, uh, Cas9 system, uh, slightly before uh, cell delivery, 
or one hour into uh, cell delivery. In this second case, we give the cells to uh, uh, use uh, Cas9 activity for one hour before we turn things off. So we here we're plotting uh, Cas9 in there's insertion deletion if, uh, years in percentage uh, uh, after three days. And uh, for three different uh, target sites, three different genes, we see that efficiency is uh, very, but uh, very high, uh, up to, uh, sometimes even above 90%. If you use a regular uh, guide RNA without photoclippable group modification, and this is the untreated uh, control uh, showing zero activity. If you use our uh, photoclippable guide RNA instead, but without light, and we get the same exact uh, activity as the regular RNA. So we can achieve high uh, editing efficiency without light. Now, if you inactivate a uh, guide RNA uh, using light before cell delivery, uh, then we can see that this editing efficiency is essentially zero, uh, 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 at least 97 and up to 99.5% uh, deactivation using light, which is good news. We get this great uh, uh, contrast uh, with and without uh, light. Finally, if you uh, wait for one hour of cell, uh, cell function of Cas9 before inactivating them, then uh, we give the cells only one hour temporal doses of Cas9, and then we see uh, a gene editing efficiency of an intermediate degree uh, telling you um, uh, uh, the dosage effect. And we think we can use this uh, to determine the temporal dosage effect of uh, CRISPR-Cas9 activities. Now that we have this method, a uh, photoclippable PCRNA uh, to um, uh, inactivate Cas9 on demand, we can then uh, begin to study how well or how quickly chromatin recovers from DNA damage upon uh, DNA repair completion. Usually, when you use uh, Cas9 or other nucleases for cleavage. After repair, Cas9 can bind and cut the DNA again. So this continues on and on. Uh, it's really hard to study recovery aspect of DNA repair. Uh, but if you can turn things up on demand uh, at a given moment, you can have a chance. So here we have uh, electroporated uh, cells with the Cas9 uh, particles. And then we shine light and uh, we harvest the cells at different time points and perform CHIP-C uh, against the DNA repair proteins of interest. And then uh, we uh, map it to the genome. And if you plot um, the chip six signal for one of the early responding proteins, MRD11, you see before shining light, uh, you see uh, MRD11 recruited uh, because of the Cas9 generated cut. After 15 minutes uh, post uh, inactivation, we still see signal intake, it goes up uh, because it usually takes 10 to 15 minutes for MR11 to detect the site and then uh, arrive. Uh, but eventually uh, this uh, signal decays rapidly, uh, marking its departure over time. Here is a chip 6 signal for another protein, uh, which uh, is a late uh, responding protein. In this case, we see uh, a much slower decay, and we don't see an overshoot because uh, this doesn't actually um, uh, uh, respond as quickly as uh, MRE11. So by quantification, we can again show this overshoot of MRE11 upon um, Cas9 deactivation, and then a rapid decay, and uh, late responding protein uh, uh, recovers much more uh, slowly. The kind of data shown here cannot have been, uh, could not have been obtained without uh, a controlled way of inactivating the enzyme activity. We can also use light to achieve spatial control. Uh, here we uh, electroporate uh, cleavable uh, RNA, Cas9, into the cells. And then uh, we shine light only one half of the cells. Uh, uh, to inactivate Cas9. Then you can transfect the cells with the GAP reporter. And uh, under normal condition without light, Cas9 is active. So it'll cut the plasmid DNA uh, using the target sequence. 
noise GAP expression of fluorescence. But if you shine light to half of the cells, these cells uh, have no Cas9 activity, and therefore a GFP gets expressed, the cells become fluorescent. And this is exactly what they did here. So we have a mask uh, showing this complex pattern, the white regions experience uh, light, and these cells then uh, get uh, uh, Cas9 inactivated, and therefore a GFP gets expressed, and uh, cells become uh, fluorescent. So you can actually have a spatial control of uh, genome editing using uh, this method. Finally, I want to sh uh, show you uh, another technology that we are developing. Yambo Wang is a student doing that. And we call this helicase fish for helicase Cas9 fish for targeted uh, chromatin melting for genome imaging. To image the genome, uh, we often use DNA fish for fluorescence in situ hybridization. And typically, uh, we use uh, global melting of the uh, chromatin uh, through high temperature heating. And, and then uh, we annealed a uh, labeled uh, oligos to bind to uh, the uh, target strain to label the genomic loci. But the global melting potentially compromises ultra structures in the genome. And uh, because all of the DNA is melted, you also have a lot of non-specific annealing of the uh, probes, reducing sensitivity, and potentially imaging resolution. So in helicase fish, for helicase Cas9 fish, we uh, melt the DNA locally, uh, shown here. So we use a Cas9 to create a NIC. So this is a NICase version of Cas9. And then 3' overhang gets uh, loaded uh, by uh, actually it recognized by a helicase, a super helicase that we engineered called RepMax. It'll get loaded here. It'll move down the three prime to five prime uh, strand to uh, unwind the downstream duplex genomic DNA, exposing the top strand for annealing by uh, labeled uh, DNA probes. So this way you can get local melting, not global melting, and giving rise to uh, a much better uh, signal to noise ratio, uh, potentially preserving the fine structures better because you don't melt the DNA globally and uh, higher in resolution. So this is the scheme again. Uh, we uh, make a NIC and helicase gets loaded, unwind the DNA to expose the binding site for the uh, fish probes. And here we are testing this on uh, chromosome X, uh, uh, two tests, uh, TED 37 and TED 5 in two different colors. Uh, in the merged image, you see that uh, uh, two uh, TEDs are farther apart in one chromosome than the other. The second chromosome actually has an immunofluorescence marker for inactive X. And by quantifying this, we can uh, confirm that in, indeed the two TEDs are farther apart from each other than uh, in, in the active X compared to inactive X. And uh, collectively showing that we can achieve a great uh, signal to background ratio uh, for genome imaging of non-repetitive sequences, and also to, um, uh, uh, to show that we can use this method to uh, obtain uh, chromatin confirmation information. So let me uh, thank uh, people who did the work. Yang Liu is shown here, uh, who led the first project, and Rajo led the second project. Yambo uh, has done the Helicast Fish project with the help from many other labs, uh, lab members uh, in my lab and other labs. In particular, I'd like to thank my colleague, uh, Professor Bin Liu, uh, for uh, his expertise on live imaging and also supervising uh, Yang Liu uh, jointly with me. We'd like to also thank Scott Bailey's lab for their help on uh, CRISPR proteins and uh, biochemistry. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Uh, happy to answer questions. Hi, TJ. That was a wonderful talk, and I think I'm starting to... The question I have is, on these days, people using CRISPR technology to add to genes, they have lots of problems with errors. How much can we improve by your spatial and genome resolution in terms of just doing editing and editing better by using this sort of light probes? That can become a reasonable technology for that? You're going to modify these things before you do the editing or, or not? Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, so uh, the... In the paper we just published, uh, and Yang Yu will speak on this, 
uh, we show that we can actually shine light, uh, focus laser beam onto a single spot to uh, activate a Cas9 only on one allele out of two copies of the DNA. So, so we can actually achieve high efficiency of doing that. But the key point here is that- That gives us a spatial resolution, right? Not time resolution. That, that, gives you time, uh, that gives you time resolution, uh, it both, because Cas9 is pre-bound, and okay. only pre-bound ones are, are activated to clip the DNA. But because we shine light locally, a vast majority of the Cas9s inside the nucleus uh, are still inactive, right? So the concentration is very, very low. This means that uh, the chance that, you know, a very small number of uh, Cas9s we activate using light the chance that they will actually uh, cut elsewhere is very vanishingly small. So we think that this approach can be used to essentially eliminate off-target effects altogether, assuming uh, you can uh, decorate a region of interest using some, some type of marker, right? So that uh, is a big- That's issue. the limiting factor. Yeah, so in, in, in the paper we published, we use a marker of a repetitive region nearby, so we can have truncated guide, guide RNA uh, complex with uh, GAP Cas9 to put dozens of GAP in that region of the genome uh, near the cut site. So we know where to focus laser light. But you cannot do this uh, for general uh, target site because you, you, you will not always have a repetitive sequence nearby. So, so, but I'm sure all, uh, all the smart people, young people will figure things out how to label in live cells anywhere you want. Right? And then we can use that technology together with the hours to perform imaging guided gene editing and achieve single allele resolution. And uh, we think that we can eliminate the off target All the mistakes. Together. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question is Megan King. Hi, I was wondering, going back to the first part of the talk and the loop extrusion around the double strand break, how you think that might be coordinated with the nucleosome remodeling and the incorporation of H2AX? Uh, so there is, there, is, uh, there is a really good question. Um, uh, so I believe that the H2AX, is a, which is a special histone, is actually already present at some frequency in the genome, right? So you don't have to uh, bring them upon DNA damage. Now, how does uh, loop extrusion work uh, on a chromatinized DNA, right? When the DNA is coated with histones. Um, um, I don't know, uh, I think, uh, so I think, you know, now in you know, a loop extrusion was originally proposed, uh, uh, I think three, four years ago, is now, uh, I think, essentially fully confirmed uh, based on the recent papers on human cuisine showing uh, loop extrusion bidirectionally, asymmetrically, and so on. Uh, the only, I guess, the remaining question is how, how do they work on, you know, not bare DNA, but uh, DNA uh, that is fully um, chromatized, chromatinized. So, yeah. This is a really nice experiment maybe to, that could help to resolve that by looking at the role of factors in that really beautifully kind of temporarily controlled loop extrusion that you're proposing. So that yeah, I think we can actually uh, measure this um, loop, you know, gamma H2X propagation kinetics, now deleting various factors, right? Or, or under the different mutant backgrounds, and then we can uh, see if this changes, or depending on where you cut in the genome, heterochromatin or euchromatin, or are you cutting near the tab boundaries or far away from the tab boundaries, how large the bound, you know, tabs are. These are all really important, interesting experiments that we can now perform. Thank you. Can I ask a quick um, kind of clarification? It looks like when you track the protein recruitment to the strand breaks as a function of time that there's already um, a cluster at zero minutes. So I guess I somehow missed what, what happens at, at zero minutes that there's already protein there or? Oh, so that was about uh, Cas9 deactivation. So what we do is that we deliver Cas9 and give the cells about an hour to experience cleavage and then starting the repair. 
right? So that's the reason why the DNA repair proteins are already sitting there because we gave the cells an hour activity. I see. Then when you turn it off, you expect initially we expect them to disappear immediately, you know, exponentially away, right? But it turns out Cas9 generally breaks, uh, takes about uh, 10 to 15 minutes uh, to be detected by the cell and recruit an early responding protein. That's the reason why we think that this initial offshoot, over, over, uh, over, over, overshoot uh, upon deactivation, and then it goes down. You know, for the chip seek data we showed, uh, uh, you know, where we turn things on using a light, we don't, uh, we don't see anything before we shine light. We only start to seeing things at two minutes, tiny, tiny signal that eventually spreads over to um, a much wider area. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so thank you, TJ. I think thank we, you. we can move um, to our next speaker. Um, it's almost 2.25. Our next speaker is Professor Andrew Spakowitz from Stanford University talking about homolog locus pairing as a transient diffusion mediated process in meiotic prophase. Uh, my name is Andy Spakowitz. I am a professor in chemical engineering and in materials science and engineering at Stanford University. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, some research that is a collaborative effort, effort between myself and Sean Burgess's lab at UC Davis. Uh, the research is done, uh, the theoretical side of the research is performed by Bruno Beltran, a graduate student in my lab, uh, and the experimental work is performed by Trent Newman, a postdoc in Sean Burgess's lab. And the subject of today's talk is, um, is addressing the biophysical processes that are involved in, um, in homolog pairing during meiosis. And so um, to give you a global perspective of what I'm gonna talk about today, um, sexual reproduction uh, is, is the uh, process through which uh, offspring are uh, produced from, from higher organisms. Uh, and specifically what is involved is that, of course, two individuals with different sex types uh, they, through this process, they produce the offspring in such a way that there is enhanced variation and adaptability uh, in, in, in comparison to asexual reproduction. And so this uh, greater diversity in the offspring leads to a much higher probability of survival in response to environmental changes. And a really good example of this uh, is shown uh, on the right, the image on the right, where you see that moths, uh, that the offspring in moths uh, uh, exhibit a great deal of diversity, both in the coloration as well as the patterning that you see in, in the moths. And as a result, uh, they have a great deal of ability to respond to environmental changes. And there's, there's a lot of historical examples of evolution in action where, in fact, whole populations of moths uh, shift their uh, coloring in response to changes in conditions. And so, of course, there's a lot of advantages to sexual reproduction, and, and, and that's, that's really important. But at the same time, the process introduces uh, uh, the possibility of chromosomal abnormalities. And so, for example, uh, in the production of gametes, the sperm cells and the egg cells, uh, in, in humans, there, there is the possibility of introducing multiple copies of chromosomes uh, through the dynamical processes that are occurring at the cellular level during the formation of these gametes. And so, for example, in the case of Down syndrome, uh, as well as Klinefelter syndrome, those are cases where you have multiple copies of chromosomes. And so, this is, this is an image which shows... Um, the, the copies of the, 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 the copies of the chromosomes inside of a living uh, human cell. Uh, and what you see is that there are three copies of chromosome 21, which is the characteristic trait of Down syndrome. And so as we sort of you know, think about this, the question is, is what are the, what is responsible for the formation of these sex cells, the sperm cells and the egg cells? And so these, these cell types are produced through a process called meiosis, uh, where you take uh, a starting point, which is a diploid cell, where there are two copies of each of the chromosomes, 
Uh, and then through the series of two stages, you produce four, uh, four uh, haploid cells, which have one copy of each of those chromosomes. And so in the first stage, which is meiosis one, what you see is that uh, first what happens is that these, uh, these chromosomes are, the DNA is replicated. And so then you have uh, two sets, uh, two pairs of sister uh, chromatids, okay? And what then happens is, is that when, you tra when the cell transitions to meiosis one, there's a process where the homologous chromosomes, so here shown in red and in blue, they pair with one another and they exchange genetic information, uh, leading to certain crossovers that are, um, you know, essentially random throughout the, these, these chromosomes. And there's an exchange of that genetic information. And that's inherently what's leading to this variability uh, in, in the daughter uh, cells. And then um, these, these are split such that the sister chromatids are in uh, uh, two separate cells at the end of meiosis one. And then there's a following stage, which is meiosis two, where the sister chromatids are then uh, split and are, are separated into two daughter uh, cells, where now what you have is you have uh, four haploid cells with, um, with each individual uh, copies of those chromosomes. And you can see from the coloring here that these have, um, that these have new uh, genetic information in them. And so for my talk today, I'm gonna focus on meiosis one. And specifically, I'm very interested in the dynamical processes that leads to the pairing of these uh, homologous chromosomes and the subsequent exchange of genetic information. Okay. so. Um, here, the, you know, so now let me give you a little bit more detail as to what's happening in the formation of this, these paired homologous chromosomes. So early on during prophase one of this meiosis one stage, um, what happens is, is that you see that there are these two homologous chromosomes. Um, and at the beginning, their telomeres are attached to the nuclear envelope and their centromeres are also attached to the nuclear envelope. And then as time progresses, the centromeres detach, and there is a process of pairing of these homologous chromosomes through double-strand breaks that are introduced uh, more or less randomly throughout these, these chromosomes. Uh, and those homologous, or these double-strand breaks, excuse me, uh, lead to crossover junctions and then the uh, recombination of, of the genetic material such that you are exchanging that information. Uh, and then eventually these two uh, homologous chromosomes form a complex which is called the synaptonemal complex, which uh, essentially pairs these two together at, at random locations. Uh, to form this complex. And so as you progress through meiosis, you see that pairing first decreases, and this is mostly associated with the release of the centromere, but then there's the following uptick in the pairing uh, due to the process of the uh, double strand breaks leading to, uh, uh, leading to this synaptonemal complex. Okay, and so here what we can think about is uh, specific events within the population of cells as time progresses through meiosis, where, um, where at this stage you have the, the first step where the centromeres are attached. And then uh, there is, in the, uh, in, within the population, you see there's an uptick in the second um, uh, state, if you will, where the centromeres are detached. Uh, and then there's a subsequent uptick in the first pairing event that takes place, followed by an uptick in the population where there's multiple pairings between the homologous chromosomes. Um, and so what we want to understand is what is the dynamics associated with the transitions through these various events. Okay. And so... Um, the first step that I want to, you know, spell out is now we want to, you know, sort of begin to think about this from a physical perspective. And so, of course, chromosomes, they're, they're polymers. They're extremely long polymers, um, you know, the, on the order of, um, you know, the, the, the human chromosomes, if you line them up end to end, it'd actually be approximately a meter long. Uh, so these are extremely long polymer chains. Um, now, we happen to be looking at this process 
from the perspective of, of Cerevisiae, and I'm going to talk about the experiments in just a moment. But if you just ask the question of if you have two polymer chains that are confined within a spherical uh, cavity, and their ends are attached to the ends, or excuse me, attached to the surface of the sphere, what is the looping probability between loci on these homologous polymer chains or homologous chromosomes. And so if you solve for um, this probability distribution for a flexible chain inside of a confinement, which is dictated by this, this what's called the Green's function, which is a uh, probability distribution for, uh, for the position of the various points on these chains, what you find is that the probability of looping versus the position along that chromosome goes from a peak for the attached uh, segments down, but then what you see is that it essentially levels off to a constant, meaning that to a first approximation, the probability of encountering homologous pairs along these chromosomes is essentially equal for much of the chromosome. Now, once you form one attachment or one link between these two, of course, this is going to give you a very different probability distribution where there's a much higher probability of forming a loop between nearby segments but then it falls off and it kind of levels off. Now, one point that I should make here to be absolutely clear is that this probability uh, for this particular state is on a linear axis, whereas in the middle and on the right, these are on log axes. So this does lead to a very different uh, picture for this case versus this case. But nonetheless, what you're beginning to see is that as if you were asking the question of how do these link to one another, the probability for uh, encounter is very much uh, is 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 very much uh, uh, dependent upon the position. But there's a great deal of heterogeneity that you would get in terms of what those linkages would be. And so, let me turn to the experimental measures that we've been using as inspiration for understanding the physical processes of homologous pairing uh, within meiosis. And so specifically what is, what is done is that in the lab of, of Sean Burgess at UC Davis, um, what they've done is they've used a frost uh, labeling system to label uh, individual loci on homologous chromosomes in order to interrogate the dynamical processes of these chromosomes uh, moving around within a living cell and, and undergoing processes of pairing. Okay, and so um, what you actually see is that you know in the whole field of view, you see many of these cells, and they have you know uh, two labels in some instances. Sometimes you see them paired with one another. But interestingly, there's a great deal of heterogeneity from cell to cell. In fact, you see that there are uh, some of these cells. Uh, the homologous uh, loci actually are moving dynamically, but they never really seem to form a pair. They seem to be unpaired throughout the, the process of observation. Whereas uh, there's a mixed population where they undergo pairing and then unpairing and pairing and unpairing as a sort of dynamical search process. Whereas then there's a family where they just are paired and they remain paired throughout that time. So what you clearly see is that um, this, uh, this, the dynamics is highly heterogeneous from cell to cell, as well as throughout the period of observation. Okay, so um, so now it turns out that you know the observation of chromosomal dynamics is occurring. We're actually observing these dynamics over minutes to hours, and so it's extremely slow process. So what's necessary for us to have any sort of theoretical understanding of what's going on? Uh, it, you know, and sort of interpretation of these experiments, we have to use um, a, a theoretical model that can actually address these dynamics at the timescales of observation. So let me just let me just explain that. You know, um, when it comes to physical modeling of chromosomes, um, there's actually a correspondence between the length scale of interest and the time scale of observation. Specifically, that. Um, if you look at something dynamically moving over long time scales, um, that actually corresponds to extremely large length scale physical processes. Whereas if you look at extremely short time scale processes, you really are interrogating very short length scale physics. Um, and so here, what, what we do is, um, in order to look at these extremely large length scale processes, we adopt a very simple perspective of the polymer, namely that of a, of 
essentially beads and springs, which is co coincident with this being a flexible type polymer chain at extremely large length scales. So what's really nice about that is that we can actually rely uh, mostly on uh, analytical theory in order to make a comparison to the experiment. And, and what we found in previous um, studies of, of chromosomal dynamics is that although this is a very simple perspective, it actually gives you the essential physics that's necessary to make that connection to the experiments. And so what, what we're going to do is we're actually going to model this as a linked polymer with random linkages between seg uh, or excuse me, two linked polymers with random linkages between them uh, that are associated with these, these double strand break pairing uh, between the homologous chromosomes. And what we're gonna look at is what is the dynamics of the, uh, the, the separation between homologous loci on these two polymer chains. Okay. So, the first thing to, to note is that if you look at these dynamics, so here on the top I'm showing the experimental measurements of the dynamics, what you actually see is an extremely heterogeneous population if you plot what we're calling the MSCD or the mean squared change of displacement between those two loci. Uh, you see an extremely heterogeneous population where it's characterized as, as having periods of essentially diffusive or what we would call subdiffusive behavior, where on this log-log plot, the mean squared displacement exhibits a local power law. And in this case, what you observe is that the power law has a, scale, has a slope of one half, meaning that it, it goes like time to the one half power. But then there's also many of the trajectories on a single cell level that are essentially level and they're just fluctuating around a plateau. And the scale of that plateau is highly variable from cell to cell. Okay, so um, the first thing let me say is that the alpha of one half is actually coincident with that of flexible polymer dynamics. Uh, that's a scaling law which is, um, which is indicative of, of a model called the Rouse model, which is specifically that of a, a flexible polymer which is fluctuating around in a uh, viscous environment. Um, and so essentially, that's what we're seeing for those dynamical periods of motion. But then this highly heterogeneous plateau, uh, the way that we interpret that is that that's indicative of there being random pairing between these homologous uh, uh, chromosomes. Uh, and that from cell to cell, the location of the closest uh, crossover point uh, is highly variable relative to the loci that you are looking at. And so if you just simply take our theoretical model and we randomly place linkages here, and this happens to be when we have five random linkages on average, what you see is that you get a great deal of heterogeneity from cell to cell, uh, and the dynamical behavior of each of these theoretical cells uh, has a uh, period of subdiffusion with the same scaling law of alpha to the one of one half, followed by a plateau, which is highly variable from cell to cell, which is basically just dictated by what is the closest attachment between these two chromosomes. Okay, so this is the picture for single cell dynamics. But if we were to look at this, uh, on a population level where we just average everything together, we get a somewhat different picture. So here, the experiments, and this is for wild type um, experiments, um, what you see is the following picture, is that if I do this population average for the dynamics, and I, uh, and I look at the data through the chronological stages through meiosis one, through the prophase one during meiosis, what you see is that um, you see essentially a early stage power law, and the power law happens to be much, much uh, lower slope than one half. And the point that I would make here is that this is really indicative of, of, of the population averaging as opposed to it being of a single cell dynamics. Uh, and this really has to do with the fact that there is a dynamical period, but then the crossover within the population to the plateau varies considerably. And that's what's leading to a much lower slope than you're otherwise seeing on a single cell level. And what you also notice is that the dynamics goes up 
from the chronological stage from T0 up to T3, but then it goes back down as you progress further and further. Now, this we attribute to the release of the centromere causing the, uh, the, the plateau distance to go up because there's more space for these two homologous chromosomes to explore. But then as they pair more and more, it actually declines again. Now, if we then uh, compare that to the theory where we are introducing more and more connections, which ostensibly is you know, progressing through the chronological stage in, in that manner, what we see is just a monotonic decrease of this plateau as you introduce more connections. Now, to be clear, in this particular theory, we are not introducing centromeric detachment. Um, that's something that we're working on right now, but that's, that's not included in the theory at this stage. Uh, and so you can really think of this as the progression from T3 to T5 as declining this plateau more and more. Now, the test of this basic picture of the non-monotonicity or the fact that it first goes up and then back down, is, is done by doing a control experiment where uh, we have a knockout of SPO11, which is, what it, which is the uh, player that introduces the double-strand breaks into the chromosomes. And so what you see is that um, as you progress through meiosis, it goes up, but you don't see it going back down. And so that's very much consistent with that picture. Okay, so the thing is, is that at this point, um, what I told you earlier is that this is a very dynamic process and that if you observe a single trajectory um, of, of the pairing events, it, they actually tend to come together and then the loci come apart, they come together and they come apart. So um, one thing that we can also do using uh, simulations uh, of, of, our, um, of our polymer model is that we can actually look at the dynamics of that pairing and unpairing dynamics uh, as a function of the number of connections. And so here on top, I'm showing you a histogram of the uh, unpaired uh, times and a histogram of the paired uh, times as it's undergoing these dynamic pairing and unpairing events. And generally what you see is that it exhibits a power law type behavior, but as you progress with more and more connections, it actually shifts this distribution of the unpaired times to be um, to to progress uh, towards shorter and shorter times for the unpairing and longer and longer times for the pairing, and this basic shift in the distribution is is essentially shown also in the experiments. Although it's it, you know the 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 shift being here in the unpaired times as you go through chronological stage. Uh, uh, progresses like this, and the pairing also progresses up in that same way. And so if you look at the same uh, pairing dynamics uh, with the SPO11 mutants, you do not see as pronounced a shift in the, in the times, both for the pairing and the unpairing. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about the dynamics for the last couple of minutes, and let me just say that um, one uh, dynamical process that we've found to be very illuminating in the past is to look at something called the velocity autocorrelation function for uh, loci dynamics. And so what you see is that if you observe dynamics of a single chromosome, so now this is one locus, um, what you see is that if you were to track the velocity of the locus in time, and you ask how does that velocity um, correlate in time. So if you define what's called the single locus velocity correlation function, what you see is that for one locus, you actually see that the velocities tend to show this characteristic negative peak followed by a power law fall off. And in fact, these are just experimental measurements. In this case, it happens to be for E. coli, but a very similar trend is shown for Cerevisiae. And, um, and these fall on this nice uh, correlation curve uh, which is sort of a universal curve for a single locus. And so the thing is, is that if you were to apply the same velocity autocorrelation function to the interlocus uh, dynamics, what you would see is that as these loci are moving relative to each other, there's this, this uh, competition or this, there's this process where as the dynamics occur, 
and they move around, there is a time period of stress communication along the strand that if you wait only a short period of time, stress only communicates a little bit. But if you wait longer and longer, then the stress will actually propagate. So the idea is, is that if these are linked to one another, that there is a finite time for stress propagation from one point to another, meaning that if one segment of a chromosome moves at one time, it takes a period of time before that motion is conferred through the strand and it goes to the other locus and it would actually move in coincidence with it. So if you apply the velocity autocorrelation to the interlocus separation, it's actually decomposable into a single locus dynamics and the cross correlation. Okay, and it's the difference between the two. So the point is, is that the cross correlation is really interesting because what is required for the cross correlation to be felt is that you observe the dynamics at a sufficiently long time that the delta for the displacement is larger than that of the communication time. So ultimately, uh, what happens is, is that if delta is too small, there's no cross correlation, but if delta gets very, very large, then it goes to behaving as if the two loci are essentially one. Okay, so the interesting thing is if we apply this concept to our meiosis data, okay, during early stage, within the observation window that we have, we see the characteristic one locus dynamics for the velocity for the interlocus velocity correlation, which is indicative of the dynamics not being felt by each other, whereas in late meiosis, it's flat, where essentially you are getting the, the correlation between these two. Now, the, the, what's really interesting is that the communication of that time throughout meiosis actually is in excess of an hour down to minutes as it occurs. So in other words, the communication takes an extremely long time to occur. Okay, so in conclusion, we've used single cell tracking in order to look at the dynamics of homologous chromosomes um, pairing through meiosis one. We've used these interlocus dynamics to understand this confined plateau due to the heterogeneity in the random connections between these. Um, what we found is the dynamic pairing exhibits this power law in the waiting time distribution uh, due to the subdiffusive polymer dynamics. And, and finally, we've looked at stress communication through the interlocus velocity correlation function, uh, which requires minutes to hours for that communication to occur. Okay. So this work was done. Uh, the theoretical part was done by Bruno Beltran and my research group. Uh, the experimental work was done by Trent Newman. Uh, in Sean Burgess's lab at UC Davis, and uh, funding support is listed here. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks, Andrew. See if there's any questions. Um, let me ask a, a question first. So, um, I I was wondering that's that's really nice your your um, theoretical study at the beginning. I'm wondering if you there's if you would if there's any way to expect or detect that the, the, the joining could be sequence dependent? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think the challenge that we have is, is you know, as you can kind of see, we're, we're trying to pull out of the experimental data as much information as we can, but, you know, given the, um, the inherent heterogeneity, it's very hard to nail down exactly where where the linkages are relative to what you're observing, right? You just have this limited ability for that interpretation. And um, I think that what, there, so there's a couple of things that, that challenge the experiments. It's actually uh, relative to some other um, locus dynamics work that we've, we've seen in the past. Um, there's a great deal of noise in this, data and part of it and i didn't talk about this at all during my talk but actually you see these nuclei almost undergo this like sloshing of of all of the fluid so there's a lot of inherent noise that's occurring during meiosis which apparently is not happening during um 
you know, during, you know, sort of an interface dynamics sort of observation. So there's several reasons why it's hard to exactly nail down sequence specificity and what's, what's happening on a single cell level. So I, I'd have to think about how to really achieve that. Okay. Okay. And so we have a question from uh, Alexander Grossberg. Uh, hi, Andrew. Uh, good to see you. Uh, good to see you. I have a question to you, uh, which is sort of theoretical in, in, in spirit. Uh, you started talking about this subdiffusion that you described in terms of Rausmann, and then you switched off uh, to talk about velocity autocorrelation function. But this, as of course you know, Rao's model doesn't have any velocity in there because it's purely diffusive. It's like there is no such thing as velocity of a Brownian particle. So how, how does one uh, bridge to the other? I just missed, maybe you mentioned it, but I did not understand. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good, good point. So whenever we define velocity, okay, it always has to be defined with a discrete, in a discrete time step. So really it's a step correlation function over a time delta. You're absolutely right. We can't, there's no such thing as an experimental measure of instantaneous velocity. And then from a Brownian particle without, um, without inertial effect, it's meaningless to, to find sure, an instantaneous yeah, but, velocity. But if you do it like this, then the result would be super sensitive to the choice of delta t. Uh, yeah, provided, okay, so provided the delta is large enough that any of those microscopic correlations are already averaged out and then it just becomes a diffusive step, then it's, then it's actually adequate. So, but you do need to define it to be long enough, but those time steps... Long enough in one sense and short enough in the other, because if you, uh, if you swallow your, your negative peak, then you are yeah. out of the game. Uh, yeah, that's true. But, so but the surprising... Delta T uh, in practice? Yeah, that's totally fair. So usually, it, so the shortest delta that you choose is based on the observation, you know, discretization, which usually is either on seconds or, or sometimes longer, depending upon the experiment. Um, but surprisingly, this is this is the thing that I I've has is is really quite surprising <laughs> is that the negative peak actually persists for an extremely long period of time. Is that relative to other polymeric you know other polymeric systems where you come to a terminal relaxation time, it 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 actually it actually persists incredibly long in these in vivo experiments in excess of of minutes. Incredibly long means what? in excess of minutes, tens of minutes in, in some cases. Okay. Yeah. I see. All right. Thank you. Yep. Okay. I, I do have a quick comment that I wanted to make, which I think is, is that I didn't make in the talk just very briefly. Um, one, one thing that is kind of interesting about that observation of the interlocus communication of stress okay, is that there's a paradigm in, in biology that if you want to see two things coordinate, that you, you try to observe that they co-locate at the same place at the same time. Now, these homologous chromosomes, we know that they're pairing, we know that they coordinate, and yet you, cannot, you can't say that they're communicating their stress by looking at their behavior at the same place at the same time. You have to look at emotion and then observe it for long enough that say tens of minutes later, you look at the other one moving in coordination with it. So it's, it's an incredibly long communication time that's necessary to actually see that coordination. And so in a general sense, it challenges that notion that coordination means you see two things at the same place at the same time. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, we have, um, thanks, Andrew. We have, some, we have some time until the next, let's wait until 3.10 for the next stop. There's a break, a bathroom break, a snack break. And then um, there's plenty of time for more questions now, discussion.
So Andrew, since you are there, let me ask you a question. Okay. How, when you look, for example, the single loci, lo, lo, single locus and the interlocus data, when you show the sort of universal curve, curve for the single locus that's average over many, many different systems, so how experimentally can you separate this data? That's one thing I got confused. Looks like there's so much noise on the data that's very hard. Uh, can you average them separately? How do things come out? You mean in terms of um, so, of observing? So you mean you comment about that you, that your behavior now has these two components. The components about the single locus plus the other one, but you have to be able to separate that from the experiment. And the experiment is very noisy because you cannot average to do that. So at which point you average and how you separate the data? Yeah, so um, so in terms of, so here I believe you're talking about the the single locus versus the cross correlation that's, that's of the data. Yeah, yeah, so, um, so the populate, okay, so all of these processes in principle are um you know so so you do see uh that the averaging has i mean you have to do a ton of averaging in order to get these these cross correlations to come out because it's a it's a it's a very weak signal um and so what we've found is that you know we do both a combination of time averaging and population averaging um, and try to tease out the differences between the two, because of course, in some of these in some of these systems, ergodicity breaking is a problem. Although in this particular one, it appears as though we can take advantage of time. Uh, well, you do all this average together, or you do them try to do them separately and bring them together. How do you actually do the averaging? That's what I got confused. Ah, okay. So in in the um, yeah, I mean, we do we do just a population average of of the of the velocity order correlation in order to tease out that that system. Whereas when I showed you the single cell data, that was on a single cell, but we did a time average of the observation window that we had for each one of those. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. So when we do when we show the single cell data, we are showing um, time average of a single trajectory. That's right. Whereas all of the population data is a combination of both population averaging and time averaging when we find that it's appropriate that the two are tending to the same behavior. And how much you need with all the noise? How many, how much data you actually? Yeah, so, um, so in, the, so it's not practical in the meiosis stuff to, to get as much as we could in the interphase observation of single cell trajectories. In the case of the data that we published in like, I don't know, like 10 years ago with Julie Terrio, uh, the student, Steph Weber, uh, who's now faculty in, um, at McGill, um, she, uh, she had to average like 3000 cells or something like that in order to get that negative peak to come out really cleanly. Um, because these are vi they're very slowly converging averages. Um, this data that I showed today is on the order of several hundred cells. So you see, there's a whole lot more heterogeneity. You know, it's it's harder to get all of those distributions to get teased out of the population average in this case. Ideally, we'd have more. Ideally, it'd be over a thousand, two thousand, something like that. But can I ask a question? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, these averages might make no sense, actually. Um, I mean, you need to show that you can get to, I don't know, 10,000, then go to 50,000. And I mean, there are, no, there are things in physics that are not averaging. Yeah. So, so I, I'm not so sure that, that you have shown that, or that she has shown with 3,000 cells. I agree. Well, we've, yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's that. So, of course, there's, um, while I'm talking exclusively about polymer interpret polymeric interpretations of this, um, you are absolutely right that there are averages that that especially for non-ergodic systems, where you have, for example, long waiting times of um, you know of of pausing events and and other things that we have explored in other contexts of polymer of of chromosomal dynamics, um, and 
what we've generally relied on is to interpret that by comparing that time average to the ensemble average and seeing whether those are trending to the same, at, you know, in the same direction. You sh and, and also that the standard error of the mean is meaningful and that it's tending to, tending to what you anticipate would be true of an ergodic system. Um, and that's proved useful for the single cell trajectories. I think that those analyses in the meiosis data, since, we have, since it's far less refined than the several thousand that we have for, the, for Cerevisiae and E. coli in previous experiments, um, it's somewhat, I mean, notably it is limited because we can't, because it's, it's just limited experimentally and it's also much more heterogeneous. Um, but that's been the general framework that we've analyzed this in the past through, through, and then theoretically through a combination of polymer modeling and continuous time random walk analysis, which is the meaningful way to tease out the ergodicity breaking question. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, it does. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yep. All right, so let's let's continue on with the the next talk is is Ryan Chang from Rice University, who's going to be telling us about exploring chromosomal structural heterogeneity across multiple cell lines. Hello, everyone. So today I'll be presenting exploring chromosomal structural heterogeneity across multiple cell lines. You know, recent experiments uh, in uh, DNA tracing and microscopy taught us quite a bit. Uh, th these types of experiments contain a wealth of additional information about, how, uh, about the chromosomes um, and how they organize. And they've shown us that uh, th these experiments, as well as the so-called single cell high C experiments, have shown us that, um, you know, there's quite a bit of structural heterogeneity um, you know, in, 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 in the nucleus. That uh, if, you know, no two structures uh, are, are quite the same. And so, um, th these particular structures were obtained by, uh, from Zhao Wei Zheng's lab, uh, published uh, in Bintu 2018. And so, uh, you know, having these, these 3D structures, these 3D snapshots of chromatin allows us to uh, not only uh, characterize the, the degree of structural heterogeneity, uh, but also to test our theoretical understanding of how chromosomes organize. And so to, to basically, um, you know, as our starting point, we, we want to start with our theoretical models, uh, which were developed at the Center for Theoretical Biological Physics, uh, as well as the trace structures of, uh, you know, uh, Bintu and coworkers, to basically uh, characterize, uh, cr you know, the, the, this chromosome structural heterogeneity. And so we've shown previously in 2017 that um, we can take uh, histone modifications obtained from ENCODE we could then apply machine learning to these, um, to, to these histone uh, tracks uh, and uh, using this uh, so-called uh, megabase method, allowing us to connect the, these uh, ch uh, you know, chip-seq markers directly to structural features, such as the compartment annotation. And in doing so, we can even predict uh, this uh, chromatin type or compartment annotation uh, in the event that we don't even have high C data. And so, uh, given these um, epigenetic modification tracks, we can then predict, uh, the, you know, the compartment annotations um, as given by this sequence of chromatin types. These sequences can then serve as input uh, for simulation using this minimal chromatin model, which was also de uh, developed at the Center for Theoretical Biological Physics. And this model is very simple. It, it basically consists of, uh, it describes individual chromosomes as uh, beads attached by springs, and these beads can stick together if they're close enough, uh, and they're stabilized by some energy. And what gives rise to compartments that are observed in experiment is basically um, like segments of chromatin co-localizing together. And so to summarize, we can take uh, you know, chip-seq markers, use those to predict the subcompartment annotations or these the sequences of chromatin types, and use that as input to get ensembles of 3D structures uh, for individual, uh, individual chromosomes. And so um, we could then, of course, interrogate uh, these, these uh, structures to see how well we're doing compared to experiment. And you know, one thing that we did early on was compare, uh, basically average over the structures to obtain these um, you know, uh, DNA ligation maps 
from simulation and compare them directly with those from uh, you know, experiment. And so here's just uh, an example from our 2017 paper in which uh, for chromosomes two and 10 for human lymphoblastoid cells, we get these um, histone modification tracks, 11 of them. And then we can predict these sequences of chromatin types, uh, which are related to, of course, the epigenetic markers at each uh, locus, and then use those to predict ensembles of 3D structures for these chromosomes. We can then interrogate uh, you know, these structures and compare them directly with uh, high C experiments. In the top two triangles are from simulation, the bottom two triangles are from experiment. As, as you can see in the insets, we capture compartmentalization patterns over uh, tens to hundreds of megabases. And so, um, you know, the, for in our initial work, we focused primarily on, you know, human lymphoblastoid cells. Uh, in current work, we've, the first thing that we've done in, in this type of model is we've been able to show that uh, we can generalize this approach, even though the, these approaches had initially been trained on human lymphoblastoid cells, we can use them to predict structures for other cell types, given, uh, given the ChIP-seq uh, chip markers uh, for those cell types. And so downloading uh, these uh, histone modifications for additional cell types, we can predict structures um, for, for, you know, for those cell types and compare them directly to no, uh, you know, published DNA ligation maps. And so shown here is examples uh, for um, you know, fetal uh, lung cells, umbilical cord epithelial cells, and the cancer K562 uh, cells. Uh, where the uh, top right triangles are all experimental, the bottom left triangles are from simulation. And of course, we've, we've done this also for numerous other cell types, uh, which I, I don't show here. But uh, taken together, uh, our, our work has you know, shown that, essentially that, uh, you know, uh, shown our view that marked chromatin segregates to form microphases. And these microphases are what uh, are observed in DNA ligation maps to be these compartments. And so, um, of course, Mark chromatin refers to uh, chemical modifications uh, to for uh, these histones. As shown here is uh, you know blue marked chromatin and red marked chromatin, which form you know separate microphases. But of course, what we really want to do is is we want to uh, go beyond uh, these population average maps and you know. Uh, compare not only our models directly to um, microscopy work, but also to analyze uh, existing microscopy work. And so uh, we focus uh, on this very nice work uh, from Zhao Zhang's lab, um, in which they take 3D snapshots of chromatin uh, using uh, DNA tracing. And so what they're able to do is they're able to, um, they're able to decorate consecutive segments of chromatin with, with probes, fluorescent probes, and then they're able to image and localize the positions of these probes in 3D. And so in doing so, they can seam together these beautiful images, uh, uh, snapshots of uh, you know, segments of chromatin. And so um, you know, here is you know, snapshot one, snapshot two, and so forth. And when they average over all of these snapshots, uh, they can you know, uh, get these contact maps, which are in uh, close agreement to DNA ligation experiments. And so, um, the, the, you know, we, we focus on first on analyzing um, this particular trace segment uh, from experiment, uh, which we call segment one. And uh, segment one is of chromosome 21, is about, uh, you know, two megabases in length. And it's comprised of, uh, you know, two globular lobes, one, uh, a globular lobe at the head and, and one at the tail. And these globular lobes are held together by CTCF mediated loops. And um, they are reflected by uh, these, uh, I guess, these so called TADs in the um, contact maps. And so, uh, taking these hundreds of structures for segment one from experiment, we can actually analyze them, use, you know, without reinventing the wheel. We can borrow this structural similarity order parameter, which is, has been commonly used in protein biophysics. And this Q actually, uh, you know, is calculated between two structures, any two structures, and it tells us how similar they are from one another. And so if Q is one, those two structures are identical, and if it's zero, they're, they're completely dissimilar. And, so, and Q spans between zero and one. Uh, and it's very similar to, you know, other order parameters like um, root mean squared deviation, for example. 
And so using one minus Q as a distance, we can calculate the distance between any pair of structures from experiment and, what, and then cluster them using hierarchical clustering. And so what we find is in general, there are three major clusters. Cluster one, which uh, we call the closed dumbbell cluster, and cluster one tend, you know, structures belonging to cluster one tend to have the two globular domains in contact with one another. And the globular domains are shown, I guess, here in, um, you know, uh, uh, greenish, yellow, and um, purple. And uh, so cluster two is this we refer to as an open dumbbell where the globular domains have come far apart from one another. And we have cluster three, which is this um, we believe to be a, a, an experimental artifact that accounts for only about 1% of the experimental data. And so um, we, we focus mainly on clusters one and two, the closed and, and the open dumbbell. And for starters, when, when we uh, look at the average contact map for clusters one and two, uh, we, we, we get the following um, contact maps uh, from these experimental structures. We can further uh, analyze and characterize these structures uh, um, by um, basically, if we, if we were to assume that, you know, going from uh, uh, transitioning from an open uh, closed structure to an open structure is in thermodynamic equilibrium, uh, we can actually estimate uh, the free energy difference between the open and closed structures. Um, you, using this type of Boltzmann uh, argument, in, in which we estimate it to be about 4 kBT, where kBT is the energy scale uh, that characterizes this particular um, ensemble. And we can further characterize uh, these segments, these trace segments, by looking at, for example, the distribution of radius of duration for these segments. And so shown here is the experimental segment one um, for the IMR90 cell type, as well as the K562 cell type. Uh, we can further look at, for example, uh, under this, uh, dis these distributions, at the um, potential of mean force, uh, uh, you know, uh, of the, which is given by these distributions uh, by the negative log, um, you know, showing uh, essentially uh, this type of, um, uh, I guess, free energy profile. And then we can further plot things like the distributions of radius duration for clusters one and clusters two. And when we further uh, subdivide uh, cluster one, we, we, can, uh, we can obtain basically these radius, uh, these distributions of RG uh, for these subclusters of cluster one, showing that essentially the subclusters of cluster one uh, signify the gradual opening of cluster uh, of a closed segment. And so, you know, that this is all very interesting. Um, now, what we do next is we take basically our simulated structures and compare them directly with uh, the, the trace ones I had shown you previously. And so, of course, our simulations are for entire chromosomes. And so what we, can, we, we do is we simulate, of course, chromosome 21 uh, for the same cell types that were, were examined in experiment, but, and we zoom in on these two megabase region that was traced in experiment. And so in, in doing so, we can apply hierarchical clustering to the simulated structures in the same way, and we find the existence of uh, two uh, dominant clusters once again. Clusters one, cluster one, which uh, is this closed dumbbell uh, cluster, as well as cluster two, where the globular domains have come apart. And so, uh, you know, we, of course we can, uh, you know, also calculate the average contact maps for these clusters, uh, you know, sh which, which is in, in agreement with the ones from experiment in the previous slides. Uh, but, but interestingly, uh, you know, our models, which are uh, equilibrium uh, models, essentially, uh, you know, we, we also uh, estimate this 4 kBT uh, free energy difference between the, um, the closed and open structures, which is, you know, exactly what uh, was observed for experiment. And so that's already remarkable agreement with no uh, calibration to the experiment. And uh, we can further uh, characterize, uh, you know, these simulated structures and compare them to those from experiment. And so shown here is essentially the, in black is the distribution of radius duration for segment one from simulation compared to uh, the same distribution from experiment in green, as well as the corresponding potential mean force, uh, uh, which is under uh, plotted below. Um, and so, you know, 
for one, this, we, we were able to show that, um, you know, our theoretical models are in, you know, direct agreement with those of, you know, from experiment um, with no additional calibration. Uh, and so this is a particular interest because if we, you know, look closely at segment one, um, the, the, the genes that are active, transcriptionally active, are actually uh, located in this linker region. And so this begs the question whether opening and closing of these domains is somehow related to transcriptional regulation. And of course, um, that's, you know, this is further interesting because uh, taking a look at the other segment that was uh, examined uh, using microscopy, the segment two, which has no CTCF mediated loops and resembles a random coil, uh, when we apply, uh, when we apply uh, um, hierarchical clustering to these trace structures, we find that the, the, the picture is much more unclear, that the, 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 these structures are much more disorganized. While you might have collapsed structures that are closed, they, they, they tend to be much more disordered and mixed together uh, where you don't have a domain boundary separating the globular domains. And, and the structures may also be open, but, but, but there's, there's significant mixing between the head and the tail. And of course, this segment two, which uh, resembles a random coil, um, actually has uh, you know, no genes, a lack of genes. And so this begs the question whether uh, the opening and closing of, uh, of these um, TAD-like, uh, dumbbell-like structures uh, actually plays a role in gene regulation. So with that, I'd like to summarize. In one, we, um, you know, we find that uh, epigenetic modifications are sufficient to predict chromosome structural ensembles for many different cell types. And also that we find from trace structures as well as from simulation that uh, there's this transition between open and closed dumbbell conformations, which might be related to gene regulation. And finally, we, uh, we find that there's this radial distance dependence uh, of marked chromatin. And, and this, uh, these uh, findings are all published uh, in this um, paper, which is under review, and it's currently in bioarchive, uh, shown here. And all of my structures have been deposited uh, in this nucleome databank, ndb.rice.edu, and, and uh, thank you uh, all. Okay, thanks, Ryan. We can take questions now. Yeah, I had to cut uh, quite a bit of my talk near the end, so there's one more conclusion than, than I had actually talked about. <laughs> We still have um, plenty of time. Maybe I'll, um, oh, um, Andrew, you want to ask a question? Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed your talk. That, that's great. Um, can I just ask, um, you know, in your, def so you're using this, uh, uh, this, this metric Q, um, mm -hmm. which if I understand it, 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 you know, sort of looks like this, this Gaussian correlation piece, um, which I guess sort of at a glance, it, it seems like that might be like, like statistically, um, okay. So what is the dominant, you know, length scales that that particular uh, coefficient is probing because oh. you know like for example yeah. another choice would be to do like the structure factor which yeah. then you get k dependence and then you know what the low k and the high k is is correlating right. to so can you just comment what it's actually pulling out of the sure, the sure. Uh, so uh, written under that equation I, I don't know if i can pull that slide up again but uh, there is a length scale that i actually specify which is about 165 nanometers and that's sort of the length scale at which um deviations between um, you know the distance in one structure versus the distance in another structure uh, is, is captured and so I'm basically looking at uh, deviations on the scale of 165 nanometers yeah okay so that and that's that Sigma parameter yes yeah, that, yeah. so that basically dials in what length scales you're probing and so that happens to be scaled up to that large radius of generation is that correct exactly. yes okay hey, thank you perfect thanks uh, so Ryan, I'm I'm curious um, how expensive it is, is it since you're um, you're actually sampling this equilibrium distribution to to get convergence for this whole genome simulation. So um, I mean we're not really doing uh, genome simulations quite yet. We're we're moving in this direction, but so far we've only been simulating individual chromosomes, and so it's actually not very expensive at all. Um, you can run basically and sample an in individual chromosome 
uh, you know, in, in a matter of hours. Um, there's a number of advances now at, at, at the center where, you know, you, you know GPUs and, and other, um, you know, advancements are, are, are being used to basically simulate the genome, but I have not talked about that yet. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions? We can wait maybe a few more minutes before starting the next one, maybe two more minutes in case anyone. Like the next one's supposed to talk at three thirty. Start at three thirty-five, but we could start a few minutes early. I think that would be fine, Margaret, if we start a little early because if some later talk goes a little. Okay, let's sit. Actually, there's one. Whenever question. you like, you're the boss. But okay. there is one question in the um, from Alma P. Did you want to ask your question? Hey, um, hi, Ryan. Uh, so I actually was just wondering, what was the last conclusion that you said you didn't have time to, to mention? Just curious. Oh. <laughs> so um, essentially, it, it's, it's sort of um, an observation about, um, uh, you know, epigenetically marked chromatin. And we find essentially from simulations that there's this radial distance dependence, uh, you know, of uh, marked chromatin. And so, you know, looking at what's different in the structural ensemble between different cell types, what seems to be um, different is that as you write a segment uh, to a gene inactive region, it forms this, this stable core on the, chrom the interior of the chromosome territory. And so there would be this radial distance dependence where you know, active genes are pushed towards the surface of the territory, whereas inactive genes are moved to the interior. And so it, it, that's basically the, the last observation from simulation. Thanks, uh, your talk was really interesting. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Ryan. I think then um, we can move on to the next talk, who is um, Yifeng Chi from MIT, who's going to tell us about data-driven polymer models for mechanistic exploration of diploid genome organization. All right, so today I would like to introduce you a data-driven model that we recently developed to reconstruct the genome structure in a diploid cell and further allow us to do studies on the mechanism that dictates the genome organization. So as people probably are already familiar with, uh, at different length scales, there are uh, different topological features in the genome organization, uh, from the smaller scale of the chromatin loops to topological associated domains and to even larger scales of compartments and to chromosome territories. Um, there are different techniques that were developed recently uh, that allow us to study the genome structure at different levels. Uh, for example, high c uh, gives you the contact frequencies of the two genomic loci in a large population of cells. And well, on the other hand, uh, imaging techniques also uh, would allow you to uh, directly visualize chromosome positioning inside the nucleus. Based on all these recent experimental observations, uh, different mechanisms were proposed for the genome organization at different length scales. For example, this active loop extrusion model was proposed um, at the scales of uh, chromatin loops and tests to facilitate the formation of this topological feature as well at the uh, higher level phase separation mechanism were proposed for large scale compartmentalization within and among chromosomes. However, with all this uh, information, we still cannot say we fully understand the genome organization problem since there are still a lot of questions that we're not fully clear. 
Uh, one of the questions that, that is still out there is the chromosome positioning in the nucleus are found to be non-random uh, distributed. But the mechanism behind this non-random uh, positioning is not fully clear. All the topological features we mentioned in the last slides identified from high C are mainly within a single chromosome. Uh, if we wanted to look at the crosstalks between the chromosomes, uh, imaging experiments can be very useful, but at the same time, they are relatively low throughput. And as we saw, they are sometimes limited with specific chromosomes or genomic regions. So it would be relatively hard to do quantitative mechanistic uh, explorations under such case. Thus, we wanted to build a data-driven model to allow us to do quantitative mechanistic explorations of the large-scale genome organization. So now I'm going to introduce you, the, uh, introduce you the model we have been developed. And first, I would like to mention some of the key factors of the model. Uh, we model each chromosome as a bead on the string uh, at, at one MacBase resolution. Um, also, we model uh, each chromosome with two homologs. Aside from this, from high C, we can uh, clearly identify two, uh, two compartments, a uh, compartment A and B, that stands for the euchromatin and heterochromatin respectively, which we use to label the type of each bead on the chromosome. On the other side, the imaging experiments identify centromeric clustering and therefore, in our model, we explicitly distinguish centromeric regions on each chromosome and explicitly model them. So now we have the model, and in further, we have this efficient iterative algorithm that allow us to determine the model parameters from high C experiments, or more specifically, to iteratively update the parameters in the potential energy. Uh, potential energy function that we use to perform the molecular dynamic simulations to sample the collection of genome structures. And at the end of the simulations, we can generate the contact frequencies from the simulated structure ensemble, just like one uh, did in high C data processing. So at the end of the day, we obtain the optim optimized genome structure ensemble with the contact probabilities from the simulated chromosome structures we produce the experimental high C contact frequencies, and that illustrate the data-driven nature of the model. So this is the reconstructed genome structure, and the right is the expanded view of the structure along the radio axis. Some notable features can be directly visualized from this structure. First of all, uh, chromosomes are forming territories, and the homologs are largely separated. And secondly, if we look at the chromosome 18 and 19, they are of similar genomic size, but their preferential radio positioning is very different, identified from chromosome pinning experiments. And the chromosome 18 is preferentially located at the periphery, while chromosome 19 at the nuclear center. Uh, finally, uh, a general rule is that the short and long chromosomes adopt generally different uh, uh, configurations and radio positions, which is also, also captured by the simulated model as well, that the shorter chromosomes are in general at the nuclear interior and adopting a more extended configuration, while longer chromosomes are more at the periphery and more compact. So next, we've shown that uh, uh, the simulated structures can quantitatively reproduce high C for both um, intra-chromosome and inter-chromosomal inter in, uh, frequencies. Um, this is probably not too surprising since, as we said, the model parameters are based on high c itself. But what's more remarkable is that uh, this high c based model is in agreement with various imaging experiments, which are not used as the input to the model at all. As shown here, first we've shown that the model captured the well-known feature that uh, the euchromatin is more interior distributed, while the heterochromatin is more at the periphery, which is again known for experiments. And further, we show that the individual chromosomal positioning measured by chromosome pinning experiment 
it's also well reproduced by simulations by showing that this uh, well correlation between the, the experimental uh, radio position as the x-axis and the simulated radio position as the y-axis. So besides, as we mentioned, we model two homologs for each chromosomes. And now we wonder how spatial relationship for homologs chromosomes are captured by our simulated structures. It turns out that it captured pretty well um, by comparing the single cell experiments. As you can see, the overall spatial patterns are captured. Uh, in general, smaller chromosomes are having shorter spatial distance than larger chromosomes. But uh, chromosome 18 uh, uh, appears to be an outlet, which is uh, shown as a stripe over here. And if we calculate the pairwise distance of homolog and heterologs uh, from this pattern, we see a reasonable, reasonably well correlation between the simulation and the experiments. And the mean across different chromosomes is also pretty much comparable for simulation and single cell experiments. Now I hope I convince you that the model physically reconstructs the genome organization. However, the cool part of the model is that we could do further mechanistic study with the model. We have several assumptions which we could selectively knock down each of them to provide us some mechanistic views. For example, different mechanisms were proposed for intra and interchromosomal interactions, as we said before. And um, there is um, also the effect of centromeric clustering, which might also contribute to regulate the higher order genome organization, as well as individual chromosome positioning. First, we made the assumption that the intra and interchromosomal interactions differ, and thus must be modeled with separated potentials, and we tested how, how this uh, assumption would, affect, would impact the genome organization. So we built a new polar model in which a common potential and one single set of parameters were used for both intra and interchromosomal interactions. The iterative algorithm was again applied to ensure that this model reproduced the contact constraints derived from high C under this case. The output of the model says that instead of lo lo uh, localizing in the interior, the A compartments um, tends to uh, spread over the entire nucleus compared with the well type. Furthermore, uh, the simulated radio chromosomal positions are poorly correlated with the experimental values. So it is important to have a fine-tuned and separate set of the interchromosomal potentials to reproduce the spatial arrangement of the chromosome inside the nucleus. And next, we investigated the role of centromeric regions in organizing the genome with a model that abolish the specific interactions between centromere, centromere regions. As you can see, this perturbation has little effect on the radio distribution of AB compartments, but the radio position of chromosomes now become poorly correlated with the experimental values. And many of the shorter chromosomes reallocate um, towards the nuclear periphery. This piece of results um, therefore illustrate that the AB compartments alone does not, uh, like AB compartmentalization alone does not fully determine the localization of individual chromosomes and the clustering among centromeric regions play an important role as well. Finally, one of the novel structural difference for the diploid cell is on the two X chromosomes. We first shown that uh, the, the model sh shows a um, different configuration for uh, 2S chromosomes, and the inactive chromosomes a chromosome adopt a more compact structure, uh, structure comparing with that of the X, uh, active X chromosome. Uh, by showing the radius gyration distribution for the inactive chromosome is significantly smaller than that of the X chromosome. And it can also be seen from this uh, representative snapshots from the simulation. And as a comparison, I'm also showing the distribution for the two homologs of, uh, from chromosome 1, representing the autosomes, which doesn't show the difference as significant as that of the X chromosomes. 
Uh, additionally, we found that the inactive X chromosome is located more interior than the as, uh, active one. This interesting result is uh, in uh, qualitatively agreement with the findings by Kramer and uh, colleagues who, who use multicolor whole chromosome painting and uh, experiments and quantitative 3D image reconstruction to show that while both X chromosome are located near the nuclear rim, but the inactive one uh, extended further into the nuclear center. One possible mechanism to this observation, uh, which is also mentioned in this paper, is attributed to the specific interactions between the inactive chromosome and the perinucleolus compartment. In addition, our model suggests that the compact conformation of the inactive X chromosome could also contribute to this interior localization as well. As chromosomes move inward, they become more compact and the set of configurations they can adopt become more limited. So the entropic penalty would be more significant for, active, for the active uh, X chromosome given its more ex expanded conformations. Thus, this effect would prevent the active uh, X chromosome from occupying more interior locations comparing to the inactive X chromosome. And we further validated this uh, entropic driven um, mechanism by running simulations at different temperatures and show that the radio uh, position difference between the two X chromosomes are different under different temperatures. But uh, uh, I'm afraid I don't have much time to go to, into that much detail, but uh, uh, if you're interested, you can refer to our uh, paper preprint for additional validations. So uh, to summarize, uh, the take-home message uh, uh, is that we, we developed this data-driven power model, which allow us to reconstruct the genome organization and further enable a quantitative explorations of the mechanism behind the genome organization in different perspectives. Uh, finally, I would like to uh, thank our collaborators um, um, at the Broad and MGH, um, and also my advisor at MIT. Um, thank you. Um, we have a question from Su Choshin. Sure. Hi, Ethan. Hi. Um, nice to see you. And it's a very elegant work of you and Bin Zhang. And you. I have a question on the, um, probably on the comparison of your model to the, the you know, experiment, especially for the single cell high C. And I think, uh, you know, there was a there was a lot of comparison between the, you know, your data to the, you know, both high C and also the fish data, right? And mm -hmm. I'm wondering, um, is it based on just a single cell um, experiment or ensemble average? And uh, what would be the difference between, you know, two cases if you try comparing the things um, in a different ways? because there should be some cell-to-cell -cell, um, heterogeneity. Right, right, so yeah, um, that's a good question. Thanks, Thanks for that. Um, so um, I guess the short answer is uh, we are, we are uh, always comparing the, uh, we are tend to compare the result, results with the uh, data from population average because, because the model we build up is based on high C, which is actually a population uh, average of uh, millions of cells. Um, and the single cell data I mentioned in my slides is um, a single, single cell high C, they actually have um, like, uh, if I remember correctly, they have 30 or so cells. And the results I'm showing in the slides is also the average of those, of those 30 or so cells. Um, but as you can see those, uh, because of the number of the cells, so the experiment data, is rather uh, noisy. Um, uh, and also like the radio uh, positioning of the, um, of, of the individual chromosome is also adopted from a, a large population of cells. So 
Uh, right now, uh, I think, yes, uh, if you compare like Ryan uh, beautifully um, showing his work, if you do like a uh, comparison of your structures and your simulated ensemble, you, you could see a large heterogeneity um, by doing some clustering. But, uh, um, but to, uh, to answer your question, like all the sort of the experimental validations we compare with are, are basically adopted from the population cells, population of cells. All right, thank you. Okay. So I have a, I have a question. Is it, is it known that when the chromatin is on the periphery that is, it's more, more actively expressed? Uh, you mean, um, sorry, can you repeat that question? Um, so, when, so you, you distinguish between the, the chromosomes that are more on the periphery versus in the interior being more compact, yeah. compact. And is there, is it known that if you're closer to the periphery that those, that that chromatin is going to be more actively expressed? So, so actually is, so, uh, are you, are you, uh, do you mean the, uh, periphery of the nucleus or the periphery yeah. of, uh, yeah. So actually it's a, it's the opposite, like as, as I showed. Um, so longer chromosome uh, are more likely to be peripheral distributed, um, but the shorter chromosomes are more likely to be interior distributed. And uh, um, so the, so also like there's a trend that you have shorter chromosome, uh, the shorter chromosome has a higher density of genes, or they have a higher um, uh, transcription activity in general. And that's why you have, you basically tend to have a euchromatin or basically the active chromatin at the center of the, at the center of the nucleus. But you have the, um, you have the longer chromosome and their gene density is lower and they tend to uh, locate it at the periphery. And also they are attaching to uh, lamina, which, you know, um, basically um, says that the, 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 uh, the chromatin that attach to the periphery of the nucleus are basically hydrochromosome. So, so this trend is, uh, I think is also sort of uh, validated by, the, by various of experiments. Do you include the connections to the lamina in your modeling or? Right, so that's a good, that's a good point. So right now the model didn't really include uh, explicitly of the lamin or nucleolus, but uh, uh, the, uh, the first point is that because the model is based on the high C and those interactions of your chromosome with all those uh, like nuclear bodies, are effectively embedded in the high C. So it should be effectively uh, parameterized in, into, the, into the model. Um, but uh, that's a really good point. And we are, that, that, that would be a really interesting sort of direction to work in the future to just separate your chromosome with chromosome and chromosome with all those different nuclear bodies interactions to see, to basically, you, by doing that, you can, you can further study how those uh, different nuclear bodies can um, can effectively affect the, the organization of, of the chromosomes. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah, there's a question from Shubha Tripathi. Shubham? Yeah, hi. Uh, so your choice uh, to model uh, this behavior at one megabase resolution, uh, what were the considerations behind that choice? Was that just to make sure that uh, the model is coarse and enough to simulate the entire genome? And the second part of my question is, uh, how coarse grained can the model be so that you are still able to capture most of the features like the chromosomal territories and so on? Right, right, thank you for your question. So the first question is um, the, about the resolution. Um, so re we, have, we do have a previous work um, that we uh, push, push the model to a very high resolution up to five kilobase, but that model is also sort of limited to um, the individual chromosome. Basically, you look at the, uh, the very detailed uh, interactions within a single chromosome. Um, and right now, like we extended the model to the whole nucleus um, and the, we could essentially do that, but uh, regarding like we didn't really, uh, you know, uh, push the model to super high resolution in this case, be, uh, largely because of the, the computation costs. And, you know, we basically, so in this, in this model, we basically have, 
have a sort of a global view of the of the new of the entire nucleus. So in some sense, we wanted to study the higher order genome organization. So it's in some sense not necessary to have a maybe like few kilobase resolution. Um, and uh, also like the comp like we, we use wide Mac base so that the resolution um, is like you know sort of a good uh, sort of um, correspondence with the compartment types, which you know defined from high C A B types. Um, and uh, regarding our second question, like what might be the optimal sort of resolution to, or like the limited, like the minimum resolution to model the genome? I don't really have a clear um, idea, but I think one Mac base at least you know, as we've shown, like works, works pretty well. So if we wanted to further improve, improve that, uh, we can stand on the one Mac base and, you know, increase uh, the resolution by increasing more information. But uh, I don't think the resolution should be lower than Mac, one Mac base. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thanks, Yi Fang. Thank you. We can go on. Since we're just sort of continuing on, we can go on to the next um, talk, which is going to be Su Chul Shin from University of Texas at Austin, who's going to tell us about genome structure function relationship revealed by an active chromosome copolymer model. Hi, my name is Su Chul Shin, a postdoc working with. David Thirmerlein and UT Austin. Uh, I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Today I'm going to talk about um, the computational framework that can illuminate the structure function relationship of a genome. To begin with, genome organization has the hierarchical structure. Interface chromosomes are segregated into their own territories and each individual chromosome is folded in a specific in a specific way, exhibiting high order structures. The main features are compartments and tasks, um, which are well characterized by high C experiments, as most of you are already familiar with. So I'm not going to um, go into too much details, but basically compartments are shown in the checkable patterns in the contact map and Pearson correlation map, whereas the tasks appear appear as a strong, um, strong enhanced contact near the diagonal um, in the contact map. The, these, these structures are somehow related with gene expression and we can question about how exactly the genome organization and function are related with each other exactly. Um, so the, the, so the, here's the, Here's one specific example on that question. Um, conventionally, uh, it's been known that the genetically active region has lower density, whereas the inactive region has a higher density. And this picture is true uh, for yeast, that is the simplest eukaryote. But if we look into more complex organisms, such as mammals, uh, then the trend becomes opposite, such that the, uh, the active region now looks more compact than the inactive region. Um, there are there are recent experiment, experiments um, supporting this picture, um, which 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 can tell us that the trans transcription activity can con can help the formation of TAS by enhancing the chromatin interactions within a TAS. However, these effects differ largely depending on many factors, so it is hard to catch uh, the exact structure function relationship of a genome then how can we understand its underlying principle? Can we be more predictive toward how one property is affected by the other? Uh, we try, here we try to answer, answer the question by using a polymer model uh, and a molecular dynamic simulation. Here is a simple model developed in our group which can, uh, which can reproduce the uh, high C experiment pretty well, high C experimental data pretty well. So basically, we model the interface chromosome as a copolymer chain uh, that is composed of two, two different types, one representing the active 
active particle, um, uh, active loci, uh, the other representing the inactive. And it also includes the loop anchors to represent the CT safe mediated loop. Uh, importantly, uh, the non bonding interaction parameter epsilon in the energy function here. Um, um, this determines the affinity between the monomers. And we, we make the interactions between the same types, between the same types, uh, more, slightly more favorable, slightly more favorable than the interaction between different types such that this, this, model, this model can capture the, uh, the, the compartmentalization induced by the microphase separation. So with this energy function, you can get the energy of a given conformation, and then by solving the equation of motion, uh, you can propagate the initial configuration to get the time series data um, that, that, that is that construct, that construct the contact map looking like this. And we can, um, we can refer to each individual trajectory uh, as the single set data because the different initial configuration will generate the different um, the contact map from the different um, folding landscape. Okay, and um, the, the the detailed form of equation motion is given by this Langevin Langevin equation, where the friction and random force uh, will ensure the thermal equilibrium of system. This scheme is effective to sample the conformation fluctuations near equilibrium, uh, but this does not include the function appropriate at all. So here we, here we apply another random force um, to represent the, the physical effect of transcription that is potentially related, that is potentially, uh, related with the ATP consumptions. So here we uh, apply the um, random but correlated force only to the uh, active loci, the A particles, and it will make the system intrinsically far from equilibrium. Here we consider two different types of forces. Um, one is to model the persistent action of transcription factors. So we apply the Gaussian color noise whose correlation decays exponentially over time. And the other is to model the, R, uh, model the RNA polymerase elongation. Um, so we apply the uh, we apply the force dipole in the extensile direction, but the force exertion uh, is, is random over time. So with this UK motion, including the uh, active force, we can sample the conformations uh, under, under, the, under some effects of transcription activity. Here is the contact map of the simul here is the contact map from the simulation with the active force of type one. Compared, compared with the high, high C result. Uh, and, it, and it shows that um, the simulation with active force uh, captures the compartments very well, and uh, the compartmental features are more vivid in the, in the Pearson correlation map. Um, the simulation with the other type of force also generates the similar results. And if we try quantifying how different, the, how different the simulation result um, is, uh, is from the high C result. Um, the contact map itself doesn't, doesn't seem to change much by the active force compared to the uh, passive case. Uh, on the other hand, the Pearson correlation um, tells us that the active force can increase uh, the extent of compartmentalization. Uh, on the bottom figure, uh, we, we, show the, we show the TED boundary that boundaries determined from the content maps of the uh, simulation and uh, high C data. Um, in, order to, in order to locate the TED boundaries, we, com we computed the insulation score as shown here. Um, the, so the, the insulation score basically measures the, the off diagonal contact enrichment, so its minima will, indi will indicate the TED boundaries. Uh, as shown in the plus, the insulation profiles are well overlapped um, um, with one another, um, which means the active force does not change much the TED boundaries. So if we look into the TED matching score, um, it, it, also, it also does not change much by the active force. Overall, uh, we, can, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can conclude that the large scale organization features are preserved in the presence of active force. Now let's look into the um, smaller, um, let's look into the chromatin folding uh, in the smaller length scale. 
um, we can track we can track uh, uh, from the from the given chromosome segment here. We can we can track a uh, um, we can track a domain of different epigenetic state, and it's it's local it's local folding um, by 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 looking at the radio gyration. Here are the plots of the radio gyration for inactive and active domains with respect to the domain with respect to the domain length. Uh, for the inactive domains. Um, the radio gyration doesn't seem to change much by the active force. On the other hand, uh, the active domains show uh, more dramatic changes due to the active force, um, such that uh, the, 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 scale, the scaling exponent in length um, becomes more comparable um, to the results from a from fluorescence experiment. Um, this, change in, um, this change in RG uh, comes from the trend that depends on the domain length L, which means, which means the domains, domains longer than, domains longer than 100 kilo space pairs gets swollen by the active force, whereas the domains smaller than, sm the smaller domains becomes squeezed by the active force. So this chromatin packing uh, at the sub ten length scale uh, implies the stabilization of the interactions between cis regulatory elements and transcription process. Um, these plots are based on ensemble average, but we can also look at our, we can, we can also look at the radio gyration uh, per each individual domain. Um, and, and, and here we, we computed the delta RG uh, average over um, each, each individual cell um, for the, for the, for long, for, larger and smaller domains separately. So here we can see clearly the distribution shifted in the specific direction with the, with the long tail, with the long tail depending on the length of the domain. We can also compute the, um, the context within domain um, per, each, per, each, per each single set trajectory. And its distribution here also shows the, consi also shows the consistent trend uh, with the distribution of delta RG. Um, here, we show, here we show the distribution of delta RG uh, decom decomposed by the statistics of individual cell trajectory, which means it does not include any uh, um, average here. Um, we, can, we can see that the effect of active force and chromatin folding is subject to the cell-to-cell -cell variations as much as the, as much as the Chromosome conformations are, her are very heterogeneous uh, in different in different cells. If we if we decompose again each each individual cell's um, statistics into uh, uh, depending on uh, in, in, by by the domain, then we can see the intrinsic difference uh, difference in the um, activity in this chromatin packing uh, by the domains so that uh, some domains are relatively uh, more likely to fold up on active force, whereas some other domains are more likely to unfold. Um, this possibly indicates the transcription heterogeneity, which does not happen in normal cells. So, so then how can, how can norm, we can question about how normal cells can, con how, how can normal cells can control um, the chromatin folding along with the gene expression. Um, here's, um, here's a one, so one way to do that uh, is to control the CTCF loop formation. Uh, the CTCF loops, uh, loop formations um, are dynamic um, according to the recent experiments, experimental evidence. So, 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 so there are recent exper experiment evidences that the loop formations are pretty Pretty much dynamic throughout the cell cycle. However, um, um, our model does our model just uses the static loops. We can um, we can we can perturb the loop formation at specific site and see the change of and see the change of um, chromatin folding due to the loop disruption, um, which will um, represent the effect of uh, effect of um, um, the change in the gene expression. So here we consider the uh, domain A3, which is embraced by the one CTCF group. Um, this domain showed, uh, um, 
show the large extent of activity in this compaction, you know, the delta RG is um, to, the, um, to the negative side here. Um, in, in, in this box plot, each data, each data, each data point corresponds to the, the value of delta RG from each individual trajectory. Uh, so now if we remove, if we remove the CT step loop, um, we can see that the, um, the, the activity in this compaction is significantly decreased as the clipping effect of the CT step loop um, is gone. Um, accordingly, uh, the, long, the long range contact in the domain um, becomes reduced um, as, a, as an effect of the loop disruption. Uh, here is the situation that is more complicated. So this domain A16, um, illustrate, as illustrated here, are inter, is, is intervened by two, two different CT set loops. Um, and this constraint might be the reason why uh, might be the reason why it does not show much uh, show much the activity in this compaction. So if we remove the if we remove if we remove just one loop to get more freedom to the chroma uh, to this domain segment, then we can see that um, the activity in this compaction um, is um, increased remarkably um, to the negative side here, and accordingly um, the the intra-domain associations are enhanced as shown in the, um, is uh, in the in, as shown in the single set contact map. So it could be just the same disruption of one loop, but uh, it it gives it gives right to very different um, effect, um, which gives so which in, which implies which implies the clue about um, how how the how the gene regulation happens along with the complex complex structure function relationship of a genome. So to summarize, um, I demonstrate that the active um, CCM can highlight the structure function relationship of a genome by uh, taking account into both uh, organization and function properties. And the, um, we, we observed that the organization, the large length scale organization features are preserved on the active force, whereas um, active force can induce the chromatin packing at small length scale um, that is subtest sub level, um, which stabilizes the interactions between these regulatory elements and the transcription process of individual genes. Um, this effect of transcription activity um, differs greatly depending on the chromosome configuration within a given cell, as well as the loop formation at each CTC binding site. Um, so therefore, uh, this study elucidates new quantitative insights into how genome structure and function can act upon each other for gene regulation. So with that, I would like to thank my advisor Dave uh, and my colleague Wang Xi uh, and the funding agency. And thanks for your attention and I'll, ha I'll be happy to uh, take questions. Um, do we have any questions? I have a um, kind of a naive question. I, I don't quite understand the mechanism by which this active force is causing the compaction for these small domains. Is it because it's breaking these loops? And is that? So um, before, before applying the loop disruption um, for the intact um, chromosome segment, it still exhibits the um, activity induced compaction for um, small active domains. So um, we reason for that phenomenon from the, um, the activity induced self-assembly, which is quite um, um, prevalent in the soft matter physics. So if it, it's just, so if there are some um, active particles in the, you know, with large density um, and with some specific condition, it is known that the particles are prone to um, aggregate uh, to aggregate it with one another um, in the system. So um, I think this phenomenon is um, physically connected or looted from that, um, and uh, and that kind of effect is affected by the root disruption as I demonstrated. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple more questions. Um, Shubham Trabathi. 
Hi. Uh, so in your slides, you showed the behavior for uh, for different cells. I remember that in one slide you had cell number one, cell number eight, and uh, those were the labels. So are those the different simulation runs of the same uh, with the same parameters, or are those uh, or are you varying the parameters from cell to cell? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. Yeah, that's all for the same parameters um, with the same parameters of active force. And just the difference is the initial configuration per trajectory. Uh, okay, and uh, just, a, uh, just a follow up. So uh, I, I think you the cell line that you are looking at is GM12878, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. So yeah, so uh, I uh, it, have you tried to look at RNA seq data and uh, and basically uh, you and apply your active force term in on the basis of the RNA seq uh, of the RNA seq data in the sense that the active force is higher mm -hmm. maybe at genes that are highly expressed and low at genes that are low expressed and see if there is a difference. Yeah, I mean. That's actually on my, um, you know, the list of uh, what to do for the next. So basically, we can also compare with the RNA seq or some comparable transcription um, data, which also could be time dependent. So we want to utilize this, you know, framework to, um, you know, predict or understand the structure function relationship that is comparable to the experiment. That's really a good point. Yeah. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question is Alexander Grossberg. I have a question about this uh, uh, active random source source. Uh, yes. In this sense, your model, uh, how is it different or how is it similar to the model by Schmreck uh, and Kramer published, I think, in 2017 in, in PRL, if I remember correctly, uh, where they considered also some sort of microphase se segregation between polymers driven by non-thermal active force. Oh, you mean the pa PRL paper by uh, 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 Kramer? Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, 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 I read that paper. Um, so it could be related, but um, essentially the way to introduce the, um, the active force in a microscopic sense is a little different because uh, as long as I remember that paper introduced the, um, the difference uh, in the magnitude of the thermal noise on the two different um, ingredients of the um, polymer chains. Um, but here, um, so the so the the way the way that the active force um, is uh, physically um, built um, is a is not just a random noise, but it has some kind of correlation. One the so type one force was uh, to include the temporal correlation, um, and the other was the um, the spatial correlation, which is a dipolar force. Um, you know that has also been used by you know you and. Uh, Alexandra Chidovska and uh, Mike Shelley in the in the recent paper. So yeah, we just wanted to test the two different kinds of active force with the two uh, with the different um, correlation source. So you you think uh, physically it would lead to different consequences depending on the type of spectrum of this non-thermal force that you use. Uh, that Kramer uh, use uh, simply different temperature, while of course you can use a different spectrum instead. So you think it will lead to significantly different results? Um, sorry, would you repeat the last part of your question again? Because uh, yeah, I was. So you are right that Schmreck and Kramer used non-thermal noise by having uh, two different temperatures, essentially. Oh, uh, so yeah. Um, you use different spectrum yes. instead. Your thermal noise is white, and your non-thermal contribution is color, is some correlation type. 
Oh, yeah, actually, I haven't checked it. So basically introducing that atherman noise will increase the effective temperature um, as we expected, but we didn't check um, how the you know, additional wine noise uh, will give rise to that um, activity in this force. I think, yeah, that will be the good point for the reference check. Um, I think I'll go back to that, but I don't think uh, it will not um, give rise to that kind of attack. Thank you. Thanks. Next question is Andrew Spackowitz. Yeah, it, actually this is a direct follow-up to what you guys were just talking about in that I would ju just as as a thought, I mean, yes. you would assume if the the time correlation, which I'm assuming is some sort of Poisson distributed temporal correlation, is that correct? And it has a well-defined relaxation time for the temporal correlation of your noise? So the temporal correlation was the broad, just the, the, the color noise. Um, and the, the Poissonian was a applied to the, you know, the specially correlated one so that there's no correlation over time because it's ran purely random over time. No, but in your, in your mm -hmm. model, you have, yes. you, you have some temporal correlation of your noise, which implies some sort of spectrum. And generally yes. speaking, if that, if that spectrum has like a well-defined relaxation time, if you are in time scales in far excess to that relaxation time, you would anticipate that it sort of maps onto an effective temperature. Whereas if it had very long tails or temporal correlation with power law relaxation, mm -hmm. that's where you would see a huge deviation. So it's not clear to me that, that it's a huge departure from the two temperature sort of picture is all that I would say. If the spectrum is that of having a you know sort of well-defined time scale of temporal correlation yeah actually regarding that question um actually i had to um you know leave out one slide um which which uh which tells more details about um the parameters that i chose for this um study because uh we wanted to make the system still in the glass region because um in the previous study um, it was important to have the glassy dynamics to um, get the right um, chromosome organization um, that is comparable to the high stick experiment. Um, it is also, you know, it is also in the same coin of the of the viscoelastic region, right? And even with the active force, we don't want to get, you know, you know, too much beyond from the, you know, the room temperature like or the physiological temperature so that was the point and yeah unfortunately it was not included in that uh you know in this talk but you can ask me uh, about that that i can show you later if you want thank you great talk thanks mm -hmm. okay um if there's no more questions thanks Uchul. nice talk and we thank have one, we have one last talk for today um, and that's Wenjun Ji uh, or Jay from MIT, who's going to tell us about characterizing chromatin folding coordinates and landscape with deep learning. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Wen Jun from Bing Zhang's lab at the MIT chemistry department. And uh, today I would like to share with you our recent work using deep learning to characterize uh, chromatin folding coordinate and landscape. So as you know, DNA first wraps around histone to form nucleosome. And these nucleosomes are further packed into chromatin domains and finally form chromosome structure. In doing so, the two meter long DNA is packed into a tiny nucleus, which has a size of only 10 micrometer. And chromatin folding is very important for gene function. For a specific gene, its transcription needs the help from my enhancer. And the enhancer contains many transcription factor binding sites, which can recruit proteins involved in gene expression. Surprisingly, in human genome, the gene promoter and enhancer are, separ are separated far away from each other along the DNA sequence. So how can the gene promoter find the correct uh, enhancer? The idea is that the company folds up in three-dimensional space 
which enables the spatial proximity between the gene promoter and enhancer. A high C experiment has enjoyed great success in characterizing company organization. So in this high C experiment, the genomic regions close in space are cross-linked uh, with formaldehyde. And in the following, the high throughput sequencing tells us which two genomic regions are close in space. And this is a high C content map for an entire chromosome. An obvious feature is the blocks along the diagonal line, which means the genomic regions within the block are contacting with each other. These blocks are also termed as topologically associated domain, abbreviated as TED. The TED boundary is often found to overlap with the cohesive molecule and the CCF binding site. So the loop extrusion model has been proposed to explain the TED formation. According to this model, the cohesive molecule, which has a ring shape, can actively extrude the DNA. The extruding process stops at the CCF binding site. In this way, company forms a locally interacting domain. The loop extrusion model has been tested by many uh, perturbative high C experiments. And the high C experiment is an ensemble, ensemble average over millions of cells. So what is the structure, company structure looks like in individual nucleus? Uh, recently, Xiaowei Zhuang's lab at Harvard University developed this uh, single cell super resolution company imaging experiment, which enables us to examine the company structure in individual chromosome. Here is an example for a 2.5 megabits genomic region. It, it is an entire compartment A region. Clearly, we can see the locally interacting domain or tab. And the tab boundary can shift a lot among, uh, between different cells. If we average over many cells, the spatial distance matrix is consistent with the high C contact matrix. And furthermore, they examined the, the common structure after cohesion depletion. Surprisingly, the locally interacting domain remains even without cohesion molecule. So this can be fully explained by the loop extrusion model. What are the locally interacting domains after cohesion depletion? Are they really random or intermediate states along the common folding pathway? Yeah, this is the first aim of this study. We want to know the physical mechanism of the tail like uh, uh, domain without cohesion molecule. And also these imaging data are invaluable because they provide unprecedented details of the uh, company structure. We would like to use it to characterize the company folding process uh, from these static images. And for more, we want to understand the uh, end landscape of community folding. So the imaging data is high dimensional, noisy, and many times it contains missing data. How can we analyze it? In our case, we adopted a, a deep generative model, which is called a variation autoencoder. Variational encoder has this kind of neural network architecture. It is composed of an encoder and a decoder. The encoder tries to compress the inputs into a low dimensional latent space. And the decoder tries to reconstruct the image itself. In this way, variational autoencoder first performs a nonlinear dimensionality reduction task. It gives us a low dimensional latent space which could give us an intuition about uh, the company organization. The other nice point for variation autoencoder is that it is a generative model. It gives us the probability of each company configuration. Later, I will show you how we relate this to the energy landscape of company folding. So let's first look at the latent space. This figure shows the distribution of cells uh, along a one-dimensional latent space. 
clearly we can see the separation between the two different cells. The cohesin depleted cell is less folded. The wild type cell is well folded. So in this sense, the, folding, the latent variable serves as a folding coordinate, describing the chromatin folding from less folded structure to well folded structure. Indeed, the folding coordinate correlates uh, with the native contact fraction. To further examine the physical meaning of the folding coordinate, we obtained the, the average distance map uh, along the folding process. This is the result for the wild type cell. We can see, with the increasing of the folding coordinate, crumpling becomes more compact. If we only look at the folding coordinate from minus 0 0.4 to 0 0.8, the tight boundary doesn't shift. However, the company can still become more compact, ev evidenced by the emergence of the, of the subtest structure. If we further increase the folding coordinate, the tight boundary shifts. So our analysis provides a fresh perspective on the heterogeneity of company organization in the following two senses. Crumbling can become uh, heterogeneous because they, ha they can have different tight boundary. And secondly, even if they have the same tight boundary, the crumbling can still become different in different cells because they have different sub tight structure. And the following is the result for cohesion depleted cell. Let's first look at the far left region of the folding coordinate. For the value of minus 2.4, the company forms one locally interacting domain at the end of the genomic region. But the tight boundary is totally different from that of wild type cell. So we can regard it as a, a misfolded structure. Next, next is the far right region. For the folding coordinate of 0 0.4, it has two locally interacting domains. And the tight boundary is exactly the same as the wild type cell. Even for the cohesion depleted cell, uh, the, uh, the folding coordinate describes the folding process. From this misfolded structure, it has to disappear first, and then is the gradual formation of native tight structure. Without cohesion molecule, the company can still form a locally interacting domain. So what are the physical mechanisms of these locally interacting domains? We performed a five-state uh, company state analysis for this compound A region. Interestingly, we found that company forms locally, uh, the tight boundary without cohesion molecule coincide very well with the transition of the company state. This is a strong signal suggesting phase separation might be the mechanism for the tight formation without cohesion molecule. In this sense, we, re we reconcile the discrepancy between the imaging data and the current working model for company organization. As we mentioned earlier, a variation autoencoder is a generative model. It gives us the probability of each configuration or company. The minus log probability is the free energy. And this free energy contains two parts, including the potential energy and the entropy. The entropy part is largely caused by the polymeric nature of the uh, company, which we are not interested in. So how can we get rid of this entropy part? Our strategy is to design a reference homopolymer system. If it has exactly the same entropy as the company, we can get rid of this entropy part by subtracting uh, between the, uh, the free energy of the company region and, uh, the, and the free energy from the homopolymer reference system. This is a novel approach. Uh, we need to first validate based on a, a model system. So we build this homopolymer reference system and also a phase separating polymer system. 
these are the average distance map for these uh, two systems. For each configuration, we can have the free end difference uh, from variation not encoder. And also, we can have the potential end difference from MD simulation. We can see these two quantities coincide very well with each other with a correlation coefficient of about 0 0.8. Encouraged by this, we examined the N landscape of commonly folding. This is the free energy profile along the folding coordinate. For the cohesion depleted cell, it has a lower free energy at the less folded structure, which is not the case for web type cell. This is totally consistent with the, with the experimental data. And furthermore, we obtained the potential energy along the folding coordinate. Interestingly, for both of the two cell types, the potential energy, the potential energy decreased along the folding process. That means the well-folded structure is energetically favorable. So in summary, we propose a, a deep learning framework, uh, which is a variation not encoder to analyze the imaging data. And uh, we are able to reconcile the discrepancy between the imaging data and the current working model of company organization. We found that the phase separation might be the mechanism for the teleformation without cohesive molecule for this entire compartment A region. And also, we are able to infer a, a company folding coordinate which can describe the dynamic company folding process from these uh, static images. And lastly, we are able to uh, investigate the end landscape of company folding. The potential energy decrease along the uh, company folding process. I would say this is similar to the uh, folding final picture of protein. Uh, last, I would like to thank my uh, advisor, Professor Bin Zhang, and also thanks for your attention. Okay, thanks, Bin Zhang. You have any questions? Hi, um, uh, nice talk. Uh, so uh, this is uh, Ryan Cheng. Uh, if, so I have a very quick question regarding your, um, your entropic corrected uh, enthalpic term. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you were to use, let's say, a statistical potential like this minimal chromatin model, Microme, and, and basically assessed um, you know, th this potential term using Microme, uh, what, what would you see? Would it, would it agree fully with sort of this um, Autoencode derived uh, corrected enthalpy. Yeah, that that is a great point. Uh, we haven't tried to use the uh, that kind of polymer model, but we try to uh, use a very simple homopolymer system, and we can, based on the polymer physics, we can calculate the uh, we can estimate the probability of the contact probability, and then we can inverse to uh, uh, to the the to the interaction energy. And the, in this way, we can also get rid of the entropy part. And the, the result is totally, con is qual uh, qualitatively consistent with our current conclusion. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Okay. I think that's, thanks, Wenjin. Um, I think that's it for today. Thanks to all of the speakers. And I don't know if Arup wants to say anything else. So thank you, Maggie, for uh, sharing the session and all the speakers. We'll see you again tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, United States. Bye. <laughs>